All right, Will Farrell is here. We're taping this at the end of May, but we're holding it for as, as we get closer to your new movie. But uh, we're in the quarantine. I was excited for your quarantine hairdo, and it has not disappointed. It's, no, it's, it's as bushy as I've ever seen it. Well, and you know what? I kind of blew it. I actually put a little bit of product in to, to mat it down. It this is nothing. It has a whole nother level to it. Mine goes up too. I, I think we have similar hair that the longer it gets, it goes up and sideways instead of down. I'm most jealous of the people with the long hair that it just goes down. Mine, mine just goes right. up. But now you, you, um, looks like you, you did a little grooming on the side there. You've got it high. And tight. Yeah. I, uh, I bought, I bought like a really nice electric razor thingy on Amazon. Yeah. And had my wife and my daughter cut my hair so that it was tighter. Because my hair, my face just becomes like this round planet, <laughs> you know, where, where uh, I forgot to use my microphone, by the way. Uh, <laughs> my face just becomes this round planet. Yeah. And, uh, and I, you know, obviously not ideal. So I, ha I had to tone it down. We, um, we just had... Somehow, my middle son, my 13 year old, convinced my 10 year old to let him cut his hair. Oh, that led to tears, I bet. Well, and bless his heart, the 10 year old did not get, get it in writing that he could then cut his older brother's hair. He just said, because <laughs> you got to get that in writing. You got to yeah. get, you know, you got to do pinky swear. I don't know what you got to do, spit in each other's palms and, you know, have a Tom Sawyer handshake or something. But, he just said, okay, I don't have to. And oh, Matthias, Matthias is, is, is the 13 year old. Axel's the younger guy. And he just, he just gave him the weirdest haircut that was shaved, but a little bit of a mullet. Mm. Shaved smiley face in the back of his head. And at first it was, <laughs> first it was laughter. Axel was going along with it. And then it, then it led to tears. Yeah. Ultimately yeah. It tears. It always ends badly. Yeah. You're stuck, you're stuck in your house with three sons. <laughs> who probably yeah. haven't been together this much in their entire lives. What's that been like? It's, um, it's actually been better than I thought it would be. They, they, in fact, they're even commenting like, do you see how good we're getting along? Yeah. Like, yeah. And I said, I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm really shocked now. It doesn't, of course there's massive flare ups, but, uh, um, but for the most part, they're just they're forced to have to hang out. And um they have developed a game in the backyard with one of the soccer nets we've set up uh called Sexy Tim. And uh they play Sexy Tim. Now why all it is is one kid plays goalie and you defend until you've let a ball go by you, and then the guy who scores now rotates and is the goalie. Oh. But it's called Sexy Tim. <laughs> and we don't know who Tim is. They just no, made we that up. Know, we don't know who Tim is, and we don't know why it's sexy. But so after dinner, they'll just say, "Hey, let's play sexy Tim." You better so, make sure it's not some neighbor with a telescope that they well, befriended or something. It's true, or it's not some euphemism that I don't know real meaning of. It. <laughs> it probably is. <laughs> do you feel? Do you feel old with these kids now? Do you feel like you're of a previous generation? Because there's, I have moments with my kids where I just feel. Like I, I'm the old guy and I don't know really what happened because you don't realize that it's happening until it's actually happened. Yeah. Uh, yeah, for sure. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not on social media, so I'm out of that loop. Um, Smart. And, yeah. And you're not missing anything. I'm, let me I, just tell you, I feel so confident that I'm not. Um, and yet it is still tempting every now and then to like, Oh, it'd be funny to comment on this, but yeah, for the most part, I just know that that grass is not greener. Uh, yeah, uh, it's true. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, yeah. I think it's inevitable that you, uh, um, even though one of the boys is mistakenly when he when he feels like uh, my wife and I are out of touch, he refers to us as boomers. You guys are such boomers. Yeah, which is incorrect. We're not. We're too young to be boomers. I think we're Gen Xers technically. I think the boomers thing has taken a different meaning the last six months. Do your kid have you been referred to that? Yeah, it started on the it started on social. It's uh 
Okay. It just means you're old. It's a, it's a new way to insult people for, for being old, the boomer. Then there was a backlash to the boomer because people were saying you're old shaming people. It's, it's, uh, it's a okay. mess. The internet's a mess. You it's, stay away. Yeah. Yeah. I, but I, I have during this, this quarantine, I have taken uh, one of the boys phones and purposely threw it out the window of the car as we were driving. Really? Uh, which sent ripples through the, through the family. And, uh, <laughs> It's something you always threaten to do, you know? Yeah. And, and then I actually, but it was all, it was all premeditated. I knew I was going really slow and it was on a street in our neighborhood. And I, I spotted like a big cactus plant I knew it'd be easy to find. And I'm like, hand me your phone, hand me your phone. And I just threw it. And the shock, um, the effect only lasted a couple of days though, 48 hours of good behavior. And then it was right back to. Yeah, it's like a coach screaming at his team for effect. Just got to right. keep everyone on their toes for a couple of days. <laughs> but other friends of ours were, were that they've been able, I think that story has been more useful for other friends of ours to tell their kids. You know, we, our kids, we have kids like around the same age and yeah. your kids play sports. So yeah. you go to these games and I've been at games that you've been at a couple of times. It's, it's a weird life for you. It's, you can't really blend in cause you're tall too. So it's very <laughs> obvious that you're there and you know, I think in LA for the most part, there's a little bit of a code in LA not to yeah. badger celebrities, but it's still, you know, I, I always feel for you in those situations. Cause you just want to go watch your kid play sports. It's not, it's pretty good. In fact, I was just thinking this, this, you know, right now we've just missed Memorial Day weekend here. Uh, we would have normally, we were always down in San Diego at this big AYSO soccer tournament. Right. The Top Gun tournament. Um, and I was just thinking, oh, wow, we would have been there. And uh, yeah, I usually wear a big, you know, shade sun hat, um, which probably calls more attention to me. Uh, <laughs> Makes you taller. Yeah. But no, I mean, most, most, most families are pretty good, but. Yeah, sometimes it's, a, it's weird. It's weird having the <laughs> weekends back, right? Sorry, here's here's the uh, here's the weirder thing. Oh, excuse me, one second. Hello. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, you know what? You can go ahead and just uh, drop it right by the garage there. We'll edit this out. <laughs> Sorry. No worries. We can't. The good thing about these zooms is we could just edit all this stuff out. Um, the but the, you know the other thing the other thing that is is fascinating to do, and that was part of uh, you know for for once again these teams and I don't know if you've had to do any of the refereeing for soccer. The A1 I've network. stayed away. I can't. I can't handle it. Yeah, you've done that. Oh yeah, I've done the. Uh, I haven't done the center ref, but I've done the sideline ref. Yeah, and. Uh, that I kind of love that because they don't oh. recognize me until about the end of the first half. And then a kid will come over to my sideline to take a throw in and he'll just look at me. <laughs> Wait, is that that guy? <laughs> Wait a second. Okay. And then the other boys will start talking and pointing. And by halftime, they're like, Hey, are you will throw? Hey, oh, what's up? And, uh, um, and I love that's that's such a fun reaction to watch them slowly as they distract themselves in the middle of the game. It could go one of two ways, right? You could actually yeah. like negatively I, distract them I, or they could uh, step it up because you're there. They would like I bring something better out of them. Some sort of outcome on the game. In fact, they should really ban me. <laughs> I remember LeBron's son was playing, played a game before my daughter's basketball game in eighth grade. And then stuck around to watch the first quarter. And I was like, oh man, I don't know. I, I could see the kids completely freezing or going the other way. And they went the other way. It, it was like Hoosiers. Everyone was making shots. We're up 15 in the first I'm quarter. Sure, I'm sure hustle plays, dive oh, yeah. for loose balls. Just, yeah. Yeah. Um, did you, did you follow what SNL was trying to do with the at home stuff and trying to keep the show going when basically yeah. on zoom? Yeah. What, what'd you think of that? I, it was pretty ambitious, right? 
totally ambitious. Um, I think I think it was you know really inspired on one hand to be able to kind of create that stuff while everyone is uh, you know separate and not together. At the same time, I think it also shows that you know the the original format for how it's done is really the value of the show. And yeah. you, at the end of the day, while there, of course there were funny things, uh, you really miss watching it in the, in the studio with the band, with the musical act, with, you know, it's an institution and, and you see why it is. Um, uh, but I mean, I, th I think it, it was probably fun for them to, to at least just get to do something and, and, and definitely fun for an audience to, to finally have a little change of pace. Yeah, there's some things that WWE was weirdly like this too, where they've been trying to do these, you know, pay per views and weekly shows with no audience. And you just realize how important the fans are to just every single Wait, thing in wrestling. I, so, have they been doing wrestling in like an empty arena? Yes. <laughs> yes. I missed that. But the, they come out, they do the entrances, but they're doing their oh, whole okay. thing, but nobody's there. So, they're. It's the music, it's the pyrotechnics. It's and but it's empty. It's an empty stadium. Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so that the weirdest part is the guys walk out and they have to have like that swagger that you have when twenty thousand sure. people are either cheering or booing you, but there's nobody cheering or booing. And and that swagger plays really well in front of twenty thousand people. And right. looks probably a little ridiculous when it's no one's out there. Well, you realize like with SNL, the weekend update was probably the weirdest thing with no audience because you just realize how important the well, audience is for that specific segment, right? They're, if, exactly. if they don't laugh at a joke, that's almost funny in itself. And that's, that segment specifically is such a, uh, such a rhythm, a rhythm segment to, you know, that's basically just telling jokes and yeah. you need the rhythm and you need, you know, that's, that's as close to, uh, to come kind of playing a piece of music as any of the sketches are. So yeah, I, I, I could see how that would be, you know, um, not the best. They're, they're doing this thing now, the whole cancel culture thing where they go 20 years ago, 15 years ago and find something somebody did and then try to get them to apologize. They just did it with Jimmy Fallon. Do you think you had that sketch you did with the dogs where you were yelling at your dogs, the, the uh, <laughs> infomercial, do you think retroactively people are going to come at you that you were mean to animals in 2000? <laughs> you have to apologize to a Cocker yeah. Spaniel? Yeah. It could happen. It could happen. It I'm, so told you that I, I'm that sorry I, when I said to Fred the dog. I, I didn't mean it. I did not mean to burst the eardrums <laughs> of Fred the Cocker Spaniel. <laughs> uh, by the way, uh, oh, no, no. I was thinking of another fake commercial. No, the the one the infomercial where you, it was like belittling your dog. Oh yeah, or, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, that one. No, I I was thinking that my name in that commercial was Way Blazing Game, <laughs> old pitcher for the Astros. But mm. um, but that was a different. I was a I was a really bad uh, uh, injury attorney. Uh, yeah, who I remember that one. Stars on his face. <laughs> yeah, being attacked by. Uh, a dog yeah anyway two different sketches but well i'm sure they all blend in together at this point yeah yeah i can't remember i mean i can't remember entire years of my life much yeah, less right. what the, the actual yeah. yeah nitpicks of of different things what else have you been up to during the quarantine are you productive are you just watch the tv any tv obsessions uh you know it's uh, you know that's been a um it's it's been, I'm sure you've, you've found this for yourself is how quickly the days kind of go by in a weird way. Um, and, uh, yeah, there's been, there's been tons of, you know, like everything else, Hollywood is kind of shut down. There's still tons, tons of things to read and look at. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, now when and where and how they will ever be executed is another question. But, um, so there's still a lot of of things and uh i've uh but i've all otherwise I've been, yeah trying to kind of you know exercise 
that's been good. Exercising. <laughs> I walk the dogs now. Nice. Do that. Um, and uh, and then wa- forcing the kids to watch weird things on TV, like the um, Ken Burns Civil War documentary. Which Just trap them on the couch? Totally. And it's like, can we watch TV? Yes. Good news and bad news. Yes. You can watch TV on a school night. Yes. Okay. Ken Burns. What is that? What is this, Dad? It's Ken Burns Civil War documentary. <laughs> and that is, that is like, what? This is terrible. I'm like, okay, well, then we can just go to bed. And then they end up kind of liking it. So, uh, yeah, you wear them down where it's just, it's this or nothing. They're going to like anything more than they normally would. The one shared experience that's been kind of great, and they've been into it just as much as we have, as so many people have, is uh, the Michael Jordan thing, the last dance. Yeah. And they they found it equally fascinating. Um, uh, just because, you know, to them, Michael Jordan is is just a name. They never they that's the first time they've seen extensive footage of him actually playing basketball. Yeah. And, it's really interesting to watch that generation go, oh, wait, this guy was phenomenal, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, and just, you know, as, as, as a fan of that era, at growing up in that era, just all that, all that insight and that, that, uh, that has been, I could have watched that for the rest of the year. I wish they had a hundred episodes. Yeah. Generationally. I think it's like the cutoff's probably like 28 years old where yeah. anyone under that LeBron's kind of the guy. He's the guy. Cause they, it, they weren't there for Jordan. They didn't see it. Right. Right. But it was, it was fun to see them go, Oh, Oh, right. This guy, the LeBron, you know, LeBron's great, but so was this guy. You might, you might have to do a last dance parody to add <laughs> that to your creative, whatever. Uh, I actually got to, uh, I was trying to remember, it's funny, and I may I, I I saw Jordan play twice, and they're two kind of interesting places. One was as a as a uh, eighth grade basketball camper at U at Dean Smith's North Carolina basketball camp. You and went to that? I went. I was the only kid from California. There was like three hundred basketball players, and wow, uh, all my family's from North Carolina. So I was. I thought. Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to try out for freshman basketball going into, you know, my freshman year in high school. That'd be cool to go to a basketball camp. And I went and I was immediately homesick. And <laughs> I was like, all these, all these kids, you know, everyone goes with their team. So there were all these clicks of kids hanging out. I'm like this yeah. kid from Irvine, California, just like sitting in the cafeteria. Um, but we got to watch this pickup game between the current team and like North Carolina legends and there was this skin guy michael jordan out there and uh so i got to watch him at the old michael gym and then we uh we watched him on that bobby knight olympic team in 84 in la yeah yeah oh you went to one of those yeah we went to watch them play you know i don't even remember who it was but uh it was just funny watching uh, Michael Jordan under Bobby Knight. Bobby Knight. It's so funny too for all of his, uh, you know, his his mystique and his aunt. He, he. I don't think he said a word to that team. They were such a good team. He just yeah. Like, okay, really calm. Granted, I think they probably beat you know Lithuania by thirty points, but uh, I don't know if there was anything to yell at the team about. But it was just so funny to watch him be just super calm and not not say a word. That was a weird time because there were way less NBA fans, obviously. And Jordan, that was the famous, they took Sam Bowie over Jordan draft. Yeah. And it was really weird at the time because Jordan was such an exciting college player. Like people just couldn't wait for him to go to the pros, but like not everyone realized it. And then he did the Olympic team and it was kind of like, everybody's like, oh, oh, so this is going to be how it goes. But it was weird that people didn't know that before the Olympic team. No, no. Um, uh, and and it was also weird to, you know, growing up in Los Angeles, thinking, oh, the Olympics, yeah, I don't know if we'll go even go see anything. You know, traffic's supposed to be horrible. And credit to my mom, she 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 drove up and she bought like 
uh, four groups of tickets to a bunch of different events. And it literally was one of the great, you know, it was just amazing yeah. to go to an Olympics, even though Russia wasn't there. And uh, I just, it was, you know, to sit in a full coliseum and watch a full day of track and field. Um, oh, yeah. It, in, and we, we saw soccer at the Rose Bowl. We saw basketball. It was, it was, uh, it was really cool. I went in 2012 when it was in London. Yeah. And I'd never gone and I was really like fired up for it. Yeah. And it was even better than I expected. No, it, it, it was absolutely incredible. It lives up to the hype. No question. When you were growing up in Irvine, did you realize that someday it was going to become the most prestigious youth soccer location for any tournament? Because <laughs> you have the Irvine spectrum. It's is close. You got a mall to go to if they're if the games are four or five hours apart. You you could actually go to an outdoor mall. It's huge. I, uh, in fact, yeah. Not only that, no, I had no idea that that was it was going to become the mecca. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it's the MSG of youth soccer in California. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I actually took my boys to one of the old fields I used to play at. There's this big sports complex called Harvard Park, um, uh, which they were not that. They, yeah, they were like, cool, dad. They, yeah, whatever. Can we go to you know? Uh, But yeah, that's, I, I just, I, I was like, what, where was this? When I was, I mean, we were playing on dirt patches. You know? I judge all my youth sports locations by if, if we have three to four hours to kill where are we going? And if like the only option is uh, a Buffalo Wild Wings, you know, next to a Greek pizza place, that you're in trouble. Just in the middle of nowhere. Well, I can remember uh, because I had played just AYSO a couple years and then they they started a, a soccer club in Irvine and I tried out and uh, made one of the first teams. And but we had to play in Chino and out in Norco. Oh, Norco. Don't, and, don't worry. Norco is still going hard and strong. And they've got, I think they have like amazing fields now out there. But but I literally remember having to hop a fence and run through, and you had to be careful not to step in the cow, cow manure to get the ball. Right. Uh, and just driving for hours and wondering, what, was it really worth it? <laughs> I, by the way, we're still wondering that 2020, I think when we got our weekends back these last three months, it was like, ah, maybe, maybe driving around every, every weekend, yeah. maybe that isn't a great way to spend a Saturday. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, um, Hey, are you still involved with succession? I am. I'm, I, I'm a, a Purdue. I mean, I'm by name, but that's, that's kind of has its own. You were involved in the mechanism, in the original piece of it though right yeah yeah were you surprised by how well received and awesome it became i mean it's probably the signature show of the last three years so crazy uh definitely only because you just don't know i mean you know uh jesse who you know writes he's he's super smart funny writer you know great writer so that's kind of a surprise but you you just didn't know if just the intrigue of this billionaire media family would be enough. Uh, um, but yeah, it is insane as to how many people uh, from all different people who I, I wouldn't think would even be into the show are like, that's a great show. Uh, it's yeah, really I, well cast too. I think that's yeah, the other thing. It's so, so many yeah, good actors. Yeah. Yeah. And in a lot of cases, actors that I didn't have a real background or baggage with, you know, like kind of fresh face actors. Totally. Which, uh, is, it just doesn't, when that happens, it's, it's, it's like you, you can, you can allow yourself to kind of follow, uh, the stories and the characters even, you know, when you, when you don't, when you don't recognize who you're watching, they become, they become real people. And, uh, and, and at the same time, just, it's just fun to kind of give those opportunities to, to, you know, new faces. That's probably about in terms of just a production company developing a show. 
that's about as good of a success story as you're going to have, right? You find a good creator. It lands at HBO. Yeah. It's cast well. People yeah. like it. That That's that's unusual. It doesn't usually play out that way. No, no it's, they're few and far between. And uh, um, uh, we're kind of having similar success with this other show, Dead to Me, on Netflix. Yeah. Which is kind of, uh, obviously, a different different show maybe skews more towards towards a female audience but um still the same sort of thing like you know find great casting great showrunner uh just a solid premise that once again you're like oh no this seems interesting i don't know if it'll work and then it it takes off but you're yeah you, you you're kind of for every one of those there's at least nine others that for whatever reason just kind of fizzle there's some hiccup along the way and yeah. then that's it. Yeah. Dead to me was a big show with the uh, Simmons ladies in my house. Okay. Season two came out and they just banged it out in like nine hours. I don't know how many episodes it is, but they watched all of them in a row for nine hours. I'm like, what do you guys do with her? Go away. <laughs> Leave us alone. It's funny how, I mean, I, I guess because I just, because as you, as you brought up earlier, we're, we're getting, we're old. Um, I'm still, I, it's still hard to, I mean, I can go two in a row, maybe three in a row. Then I got to shut it down and take a little break, digest. Yeah. Maybe come back the next day or a couple of days later. And, but I, I don't, I can't do the nine hours in a row. Depends how, how much I, is I going on with the show. Much. Like, yeah. Like Ozark, I could not do more than two in a row because it's there's just so much going on and and it's such a dark show. You don't want to go yeah, too far. Seen it. Yeah, yeah. That one's a good one. Yeah, yeah, you'd like that one. What's up with uh, your new movie? Uh, well, we uh, this is a movie that is it's twenty years in the making. Um, no joke. Well, not in the making. I take that back. I've had the idea of wanting to do something on this cultural phenomenon for 20 years which is the i don't know bill if you're familiar at all with or if any of your listeners the eurovision song contest which is uh takes place in may every year um and it it was basically kind of this thing that they started in post world war ii 1950s just to kind of uh unify europe in a way and uh yeah and it's it's basically it, I mean it's it's essentially a singing contest between all the countries of Europe, uh, <laughs> including <laughs> Australia and Israel. For what reason? Oh, shoehorned in. Yeah, I don't know why. Um, <laughs> uh, but it's gone on. It's gone on for sixty years, sixty five years. But um, ABBA kind of got discovered at Eurovision, and you know. Celine Dion kind of got her break there. A bunch of people have sung there. And it's this thing that uh, it, they get 180 to 200 million viewers every year. Uh, and I first saw it when uh, uh, my wife and I went to Sweden for the first summer. And we sat down and her cousin was like, should we watch, shall we watch Eurovision? And I, I, <laughs> I said, I, I, I guess, I don't know, what is that? It's like, Oh, you don't know. Let's watch. And it was the final night. And all the acts sing, and then they have this vote tabulating system. And it it's like a three-hour show. And I was literally, you know, and it's from the ridiculous to the sublime between the types of songs and just crazy staging. And some are legit like good songs, and some are the worst songs you've ever heard. Um, but I just was always like, oh, this is this is a movie. And, right. And I, I never, I just thought, I just assumed I would make it and no one ever did. And about four years ago, I started talking to uh, one of our producers and a, a writer buddy of mine. I was like, let's fly over to Copenhagen. That's uh, that was the country that was hosting that year. And let's watch this thing. You guys got to see how crazy it is because I'm telling you there's a movie. And so that was the year that this, this, uh, Conchita Verst won for Austria. Uh, she's well. She's a man. She's a she's a man. She's a beard bearded man, but with long hair in a full length gown. Um, yeah. So she's trans, right? Yeah, yeah. 
and um, she won the the song. <laughs> she won Austria in this kind of amazing spectacle thing, and uh, uh, and that's when we sat and talked with uh, the Eurovision people, and uh, uh, we're like, "Would you let let us make a movie?" And they they were like, "Yeah, I think so, sure." Uh, <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, so so myself and uh, Rachel McAdams are are uh, are participants from Iceland. And we are, uh, yeah, we are, we are, we are not supposed to uh, win the Icelandic contest. We kind of get in on a technicality, and we go on to compete in the in the entire uh, competition. So you had to you had to do an Icelandic accent. I'm guessing. I did. I had to do. It's, uh, it's a little monotone, right? Isn't it a little like this? It, 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 I I kind of leaned on my Swedish accent. Uh, a little bit and uh um and that was it and that was it yeah it's a basically <laughs> crossover wait i gotta ask you about the swedes yeah because we got we got bought by spotify swedish company oh yeah and i'd say you know after after you get bought you become a spotify employee you have to fly to sweden but obviously we can't fly anywhere but they fly every person who becomes a spotify employee you have to spend four days in sweden but i was gonna have to go there a bunch of times and i was like boning up on all the Sweden stuff, but now we so, can't go anywhere. But give me some Sweden tips. Were you going to go to Stockholm, I would think, right? Yeah, Stockholm. Uh, you Well, eventually you'll get to go. And uh, yeah, great city. Great. Handsome country. Handsome. Yes. Like, like pretty much you'll walk down Stockholm. Men and women are just beautiful people. Yeah. Yeah. I noticed I did an event for them in September and it was half the Swedish part of the company and half the American part. And it was just like, wow, can, I can kind of tell who's here from Sweden. Just like <laughs> handsome group. <laughs> and the Americans all look. Very yeah. The Americans disheveled. Yeah, we're, disheveled. We're, we're Brooklyn beards. No, I saw some of the, uh, the most like well-dressed people and they're just out on their lunch break, you know, walking around and uh, um, perfectly coiffed, beautiful Scandinavian features. Uh, uh, yeah, you'll have to, um, there's a lot to do. You have to go to my favorite museum in, uh, probably in the world, uh, the Vasa, the Vasa Museum. What's that? Which is a, um, it's a, a ship from, it sounds weird. It is a ship from the 1600s, a big sailing ship that they dredged up from the bottom of the harbor. Wow. And is perfectly preserved. Perfectly preserved. Wow. Uh, because it just sat there for 500 years. And, you know, and everyone knew, and it's this really fascinating story of, of Sweden at the height of their colonial powers and the kind of hubris of, King Gustav Vasa wanted the tallest warship in the world, and he wanted it built to these certain specifications. And the shipbuilders kept saying, we can do that, but it's going to tip over immediately, just so you know. Like, <laughs> right. it's too narrow. And yeah. It's like, keep going. And, and then they checked in with him later. And they're like, just so you know, once again, we want to have another little chat. How's the ship building? It's going great, but just so you know, we, it's going to tip over. And then he's like, I don't care. <laughs> Keep building it. And the shipbuilder dies and his son takes over. And even he tries to sit down with the king and says, I'm just about done with it. It's looking great, but it's going to tip over and, and it's not going to work. And uh, sure enough, the day they decide to sail, a, a, a big wind, it sails for maybe 30 seconds. And... Uh, the wind catches the sails. All the cannons lurch over to one side. It throws and it sinks in like five minutes. And there it just rested. Um, and because the the conditions at the bottom of a Stockholm harbor are are uh, it, it never ate the the wood away. And and they knew it was sitting there. And so here was Sweden in the 1950s, just flush with cash after World War II, because they just they were neutral, so they, they didn't have any damage. And Smart move. So, and they were, we've got money. Let's uh, dredge up the ship. 
And, yeah. and so they did this huge engineering thing. Anyway, it sits in this museum and uh, it's this crazy thing that you wouldn't think looking at a ship would be that interesting, but it's uh, everyone, we go, you know, when we go every summer, we bring our friends like, come on, we have to go drive into Stockholm and go to Vasa and people are like blown away by it. So that but, sounds like but, something that sounds like something Trump would have done. No, yeah. keep building it. Keep building it. And then when it sank, he just would have blamed everyone else. And, I told them it was going to sink. And that's what <laughs> this guy kind of did. There were, there were like hearings and they, they first, they said, uh, uh, was it witchcraft? Well, I don't know. Let's look into it. It was like very similar. Like they had commissions to try to figure out. And the ship, the shipbuilding family kept saying, we've told you 80 times. It yeah. was built too tall. <laughs> no right. Listen. Um, anyway. He's just pointing fingers at everybody else. Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right. So that comes out what day? July 20 or June 23rd? Uh, June. Uh, that is June 22nd. June 26th. June 26th. I'm they, just going to keep shouting out dates until it's the right one. June 28th, June 20th. Anywhere from the 23rd to the 26th. Just, <laughs> just tune into Netflix. You've got a good chance of seeing it. Oh, it's on Netflix. It's Netflix. Yeah. We're, uh, Oh, look at you. It, it's one of those movies where, you know, we were like, thank God we're with Netflix right now. Yeah, seriously. All right. Well, it was good to see you. How, how do we feel about LAFC? Uh, and I, uh, they'll come back. MLS will come back at some point soon, right? Well, aren't they? They're going to do this tournament, right? Yeah. And and then they'll they'll try to uh, uh, maybe f play games after this tournament. Yeah. For people who don't know, you're you're a minority owner of the uh, LAFC yes. team. That was smart. That was smart to get in on that. That was what. That was a. That was a smart. Have to. Uh, slightly pat myself on the back i mean they leverage you a little bit you have to you have to work when you're at the games you have to work on the video screen when you get shown stuff like that <laughs> but no i i i i just i had a good i just remember when they talked about this stadium was going to be next to the coliseum yeah soccer only i remember thinking this is going to work out it's it's one of the best executed start to finish launches of a team that I've seen because they even figured out how to make it seem like the team had a tradition in the beginning with the fans and the, the Eagle, is it an Eagle or a Falcon? It's a Falcon. Falcon. All, um, all, Falcon. Yes. all that, all those little twists. And it seems like they've been around for 30 years. And meanwhile, it was created like two years ago, but it doesn't feel that way. They're, they had a, Tom Penn and the team, you know, the team president and er everything from, yeah, every move they've made is, is been on to, uh, yeah, all, cultivating that fan base. Also too, uh, John Thornton, the, the GM had never been a GM before too. And he's made yeah. great moves with the players. And uh, yeah, I'm kind of like, I think everyone would have been happy if, if they, you know, just would have, been 500 or you right. know and they on top of everything that amazing atmosphere they turn out to be really good it's it's a cool thing the size of the stadium was really smart too that's why i'm hoping when when bomber makes the clippers arena i think there's there's real wisdom in a smaller arena where it's more compact it feels more special to be there i think and, you should, uh, i think you know. you should i think you should just do like 2000 seats that's it <laughs> really tight <laughs> like Pepperdine says. Yeah, exactly. Pepperdine. Yeah, every seat that. is five thousand a game. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, good luck with the movie. It was good seeing you. All right, Bill. You too. All right. Take care.